Good morning. We're going to be reading chapter five and six of The Golden Goblet by Eloise Jarvis McGraw. And before we get to reading, we're going to define some of our words that you're going to hear in the story so that you know what they mean when we come to it. So first we have obsequious. Obsequious means obedient or attentive to an excessive or servile degree. Monotonous means dull, tedious, and repetitious, lacking in variety and interest. Disconsolate means without consolation or comfort, happy, unhappy. Stolid means of a person, calm, dependable, and showing little emotion or animation. Inert means lacking the ability or strength to move. Indiscriminately means in a random manner, unsystematically. Okay, let's begin reading. Chapter five. Gebu's joviality lasted for several days, and as was usual during these periods, Ranafir fared better as to food. His stomach ceased gnawing, but his anxieties did not. He was able to show fair patience for the first day or so of waiting for the grains of gold to accumulate in Ibni's next wineskin. But after that, though he told himself it was still too early, he could not help expecting every moment to see Heket's signal that Rek had been told, and all was well. At last, on the fourth morning, close to midday, he noticed Heket standing close beside Rex's work table. Ostensibly, watching the goldsmith raise a bowl, but actually whispering to him under cover of the hammer taps. Renafir turned away quickly, terrified that someone else would notice. He need not have worried. Anxiety caused him to make so many blunders the rest of the day that the whole works, workshop whole shop's attention was irritably focused on himself. When he reached the gold house next morning, he glanced instantly toward the big washing baths. Ibni was there, the same as every other day, unconcernedly dumping a sack of raw gold into the vat. For a moment, Ranafir could not believe it. Surely, once Rek knew he would turn Ibni out of the shop forever, Surely it was Ibni who was doing the thieving. Perhaps Rek did not know yet. Perhaps Heket had been telling him something else yesterday. Or, horrid thought, perhaps Rek had not believed him. All day, Ranafir went about his duties mechanically, forcing himself to abide by his own decision that he and Heket should not be seen in conversation. At last, in the late afternoon, he could bear it no longer. He watched his chance and stooped close beside Heket on the pretext of helping him stoke an oven. Have you told him yet? I, yesterday. I thought so. Why does he not do something then? I do not know. Perhaps he cannot find the wineskin. Did he believe you? I am sure he did. You did not mention my name? You know I would not. There was nothing to do but go on waiting that day and the next and the next. Eight days gone already. Ranafir thought as he walked homeward one evening, yet nothing has changed at all. There must be much gold in that wineskin by now. In another day or two, Ibni will be waiting for me again, handing me the filthy thing, and I shall have to take away that proof too. And then we must start all over and wait and wait and wait some more. I cannot do it. I cannot. I'll run away first. I'll slip away to the docks at night. That's what I'll do. And hide on a Nile boat and go wherever it takes me. I... But then what would I do and how would I live? Suppose the boat was sailing south, straight into Cush, where men are barbarians and the gods are not true gods, and people speak gibberish instead of talking sensibly as Egyptians do. Suppose a sharp coll collision with a puffing fat man brought Renafir up short. Next instant, he was knocked off balance again by a group of urchins scrambling past him to be shoved aside in their turn by workers dashing off the ferry boats. They had just boarded and into the road. Blinking, Ranafir stared about at him. Something was happening. People were shouting, gesturing to each other, beginning to run all in the same direction, southward toward the palace. Confused and jostled, 
Ranafir was swept along by the crowd, trying in vain to catch a glimpse of the palace walls over the sea of bobbling heads. At the sound of drums up ahead and the squeal of trumpets, his curiosity drove even his anxieties from his mind. He was trying to force his way around a stubbornly motion motionless donkey when a hand caught his arm. Don't hurry, young one. You don't want to see it. See what? What is it? As the crowd streamed past, Renefir tried impatiently to free his arm, but the donkey's owner held it fast. Turning, Renefir saw that it was the old man he had met at the papyrus march. Marsh. It's an execution, young one. I turn back. You'll see enough killing before you're as old as I. Renefir squinted again toward the palace walls, partially visible beyond the palm-fringed garden of a nobleman's villa. The drums were pounding louder, as if to drown out a faint but spine-chilling screaming. The small, struggling figure of a man was being hoisted by one roped foot up the palace wall to be fastened halfway to the top and left dangling, head downward. Another followed. Who are they, ancient? Renefir asked. What have they done? They are tomb robbers, young one. They broke into the palaces of silence. Places of silence. They stole away the dead pharaoh's treasures and sold them in the marketplace. I, they deserve what they get, but you don't need to watch it. Tomb robbers? Shivering, Ranafir stared at the distant copper-brown figures writhing against the white wall. Because of these wicked ones and their thievery, the ba of some long-dead pharaoh was now starving and destitute in the land of the West, stripped of the magical protection of his jeweled amulets, robbed of the food and gold and furniture and weapons, placed inside his tomb to sustain him in luxury for his 3,000 years of paradise. If the wicked ones had harmed his mummy, then even his ba was dead, for a man's soul could not live if his former body were destroyed. Murder of the soul was a terrible, unnatural crime, hideous to think about. His flesh crawling. Ranafir hastily turned his back, pulling away from the ancient. You are right. I don't want to see it. Let me go, old one. You have wisdom as well as youth, a most unusual combination. The old man released him, chuckling, and Renefir started back along the street. Such cheerfulness grated on him today. The ancient followed, however, giving a tug on his donkey's lead rope. Come along, my little lotus. Quicken your hoofbeats. It is not every day we may walk with one so young and wise, though indeed I believe he is trying to run away from us. Nay, I am not. Renefir slowed his pace, ashamed of his surliness. To make amends, he patted the donkey's coarse-haired, fuzzy head. I see you have sold your papyrus, he added, nodding toward the empty pack baskets. Aye, at the sale makers. They pay little, but it is enough for Lotus and me. Today was a good day. My baskets near burst under the load. The old man cackled happily, digging six copper ring coins out of his skimpy sash and exhibiting them to Ranafir. I shall have cakes with my lentils tonight and sleep sound on my mat. He whirled the rings on his fingertip, then tucked them away, patting his sash complacently. Where do you live? Ranafir asked. Yonder, where the fields of the flower growers end and the desert begins. The ancient pointed a thin finger westward. The land there is waterless, but free to anyone. I build, built me a little house out of bricks I made with my own hands. I every brick. He repeated as Ranafir looked at him with sudden interest. I had no straw to put in them, but they will last my life and my old donkeys. We are happy there, Lotus and I. And the donkey? Is he there? Is there pasture for him? Not a blade, not a twig, young one, but he has learned to like papyrus. The ancient gave his high-pitched chuckle. His one eye brought an, an as bright as enamel under the dark line of coal painted on the upper lid. Also, I buy him a handful of grain when I have an extra copper. He does not ask much. Affectionately, he pulled the little beast's ear, then nodded toward a small street they were approaching. I leave you here. Farewell, young and wise one. May I never see you hanging from the palace walls. Cackling cheerfully, he turned off down the crooked lane, the old donkey plodding behind him, Ranafir watched until the shadow swallowed him, them, then walked on through the dusk-filled streets in which an occasional torch bloomed now over doorway or gate. He is happy, the boy thought. He eats, he sleeps in a house he made himself, he has coppers in his sash. 
Why could I not go in the early mornings to the marshes, cut papyrus and sell it to the sail makers, then be Rex apprentice the rest of the day? Holy mother mutt, why not? I too could live on the edge of the desert near my father's tomb. I could make bricks for a house. I could... He turned a last corner and stopped, his excited day dreams fading. There was a familiar gate. There was the familiar gate, the ugly street, the reality. I cannot do all that, he thought. I do not even have a donkey to carry the papyrus. And besides, there is Gebu. I must go on waiting. Next morning, there was a strange, a stranger in Ibni's place at the vats. To Renifer, it was as if the sun had come out at last after weeks of gloomy night. The sky was radiant, the air on his cheek miraculously caressing. Even the ovens seemed things of beauty, and every worker in the shop a skilled and witty fellow. He flew about his tasks, buoyant with triumph and overflowing with energy. Wreck wet watched him speed back and forth between shop and courtyard and finally stopped him smiling. You will not last the day if you keep up this pace. What has got into you? Did you swallow a hive of bees? bees? Nay, master, I, it is nothing. Renifer did not know what to say. It is something, but I did not mean to pry. May the gods continue to smile on you, little one, for a change. Now, run to Abba the potters for me and get the new crucible to replace that faulty one. Also, buy five measures of natron on your way back. Tomorrow, perhaps, you may make me a few gold leaves for Lady Hatatsu's bracelet. Scarcely touching the ground in his rapture, Renifer sped through the city of the dead to Abba's shop, and from there to the long, low shed in the marketplace where the dealers in natron and spices and incense sold their wares. He was leaving the marketplace with his nostrils still full of rich fragrances, when he saw Ibni the Babylonian emerging from a wine shop just ahead of him. In a panic as sudden as it was unreasoned, Renifer wheeled into an alley and crouched there, trembling until the Babylonian was certain to be gone. Even then he dared not venture onto the big streets, but found his way back to the gold, the gold house furtively, through the alleys like one hiding from pursuers. Why? Why? He kept asking himself angrily. I've nothing to fear from him. He cannot possibly know it was I who told Wreck. Indeed, it was not I who told Wreck. For all Ibni knows, no one told Wreck at all. He merely discovered it. The rapture was gone from the day, nevertheless. Ibni was here and alive in the city of the dead, whereas Ranifir had somehow been thinking of him as simply gone like a puff of smoke. Gebu was still here and alive, too. Very much so. And the aftermath of Ibni's dismissal was still to come. Ibni would certainly report to Gebu if he had not already done so. And would Gebu ever believe Ranafir had nothing to do with it? He dawdled on the way home, fighting off wave after wave of dread. When he reached the street of the crooked dog, he found the gate of Gebu's house open. Torchlight flickered with the courtyard, within the courtyard, and there was a mumble of voices. Slowly, on feet that wanted badly to run the other way, Ranafir walked into the courtyard. The voices belonged to Ibni and Gebu. They stood together in the middle of the paved space, and Gebu held a torch. He extended it and squinted through its light at Renifir. Renifir, but merely grunted without interest when he saw who it was and turned back to Ibni. Nay, nay. You have served me well enough, but you're no use to me now. Can you not see that? You must find some other master. Some other? But how will I live? You promised me. I promised you nothing. Come on now, be off with you. Gebu started toward the gate, but Ibni clung to his arm and continued his panic-stricken whine. You did, I, you did indeed at the wine shop that night when we struck our bargain. You said, <clears throat> I said nothing I remember of. Be off. Gebu brushed him away with a careless gesture that nevertheless sent him sprawling and strode on past Ranafir to the gate, where he looked this way and that along the street, holding his torch high. Ask the boy, Ibni cried, apparently catching sight of Ranafir for the first time. Here's the young one, ask him. He scrambled to his feet and darted over to Ranafir with his most obsequious smile and the hateful hand rubbing. You'll help old Ibni, won't you? I'll wager you missed me today and wondered where I was. Well, I've been turned off. 
I've been accused unfairly of someone else's evil doing. Can I help that? I'm the soul of honor, always have been. I trust people's promises. Tell your honored brother how he hel- he promised me a copper a day for life if I would serve him at the gold shop. I know nothing about it, Ranafir muttered, brushing past the Babylonian in his turn. He walked quickly to the storeroom and went inside. There he stood in the darkness, clinging to the gritty edge of a shelf and breathing fast with joy. He could scarcely believe his luck. Obviously, all was well at last. All was better than he had dared hope. Neither Ibni nor Gebu suspected him of any connection with the affair. Gebu was not in a rage. Incredibly, he did not even seem much interested. How could that be? After all the rages and beatings concerning these cursed cursed wineskins. Still, thought Renafir, the last time I brought the wineskin, he did not seem much interested either. He said to Wenamon, it is of small importance now. Why just then? Nothing had changed that day that Renafir could remember, except that Gebu's mood had suddenly altered, as it often did, and food had been more plentiful since. He gave it up. What mattered was that Gebu was not interested. He was waiting for someone, no doubt, Wenamon or that Nile boat captain, and his mind was on something else. Ranafir prayed to Ammon that it might stay there. Groping along the shelf, he found half a bread loaf and several onions. He ate them quickly while the voices went on outside, then dipped a mug of water and drank deeply. A sudden roar of anger broke, brought him to the doorway. Gebu had come to the end of his patience with Gib- Ibni's whining. Tie that tongue of yours in a basket and throw it in the Nile, he bellowed. You'll get nothing more from me. Get out and don't come back. He gave the Babylonian a push that sent him careening out the gate into the arms of Wenaman, who was just coming in. Wenaman dropped his unexpected burden, sidestepped disdainfully, and entered the courtyard. Ah, here you are, Gibba grunted. Ibni picked himself up, was shrilling venomously. Very well, very well. We'll see how you fare without me. You'll get no one else to do your bidding at Wreck the Goldsmiths. That boy won't. No use to ask him. Gebu closed the gate on his face. Him and his paltry wineskins. There there are far bigger birds in the air than Wreck the Goldsmith, eh, my friend? He grinned at Winneman in a slow, sly way that made Ranafir suddenly uneasy, much as he had enjoyed seeing the last of Ibni. Deciding abruptly that he that what he wished now was the obscurity of, the, of his corner, he started for the acacia tree. Gebu's voice stopped him. You, Ranafir, I'm going out. If you should, any should ask for me, send them to Mutra's wine shop. Gebu turned away, then turned back. About tomorrow, you're finished at Rex. Come to the stone cutting shop at first light in the morning. You're apprenticed to me now. Again, he turned to go, leaving Ranafir too stunned at first to move or even speak. Gebu was at the gate before he found his voice. Wait, Gebu, wait. Well, Gebu grunted, turning. I, I, please, what did you just say now? I said, come to the stone cutting shop at first light tomorrow. You will start your apprenticeship. But you cannot mean that. You cannot mean. I mean what I say as always, Gebu said, walking on again. Ranafir rushed after him and caught his sleeve. Do you mean I cannot go back to Rex, not ever? Oh, please, st- leave off that yowling. But please, oh, please do not make me leave gold working. I do not want to be a stone cutter. I silence, get out of the way. But why are you doing this? Why, I have done nothing. Gibu glanced at him impatiently. Did you not hear the Babylonian? It is all over at the goldsmiths. I told you before, I must have some use of you. But I earn Devon at Rex and I'll bring them, I bring them all home. Wait, listen, wait, listen to me, please. Let me go to the gold house tomorrow, only tomorrow. Rec will expect me, he does not know. I sent word to him an hour ago. Out of the way now, come friend, we're late. Pushing around a fear aside, Gebu opened the gate and raised his torch for one of men to pass through. Nay, please, please let me go tomorrow. Only one more day, I was to make little golden leaves tomorrow. The gate slammed. The torch light was cut off by the wall. Ranafir dropped to his knees on the pavement and burst into sobs. Later, when the moon had climbed high over the courtyard wall, Gebu came home again. Ranafir was waiting for him, huddled deep in the shadow of the acacia tree.
He had rehearsed many times every word he was going to say. Now the time had come. As Gebu bolted the gate behind him and started for the stairs, Ranifer came out of the shadows under the acacia tree and walked across the moonlit pavement toward him. Eh, mother of the of night, what is that? Gebu gasped and fell back a few paces, then straightened himself in anger. Is it you, worthless one? Curse you. What do you mean coming upon me like that? I thought you were a keft. Gebu, I want to talk to you. Please, listen. Well, well, make haste. I'm tired. I want my mat. I, it is about the apprenticeship. And if you stop to swallow, you will begin tomorrow, and that's all I have to say about the apprenticeship. Do not waste your breath arguing. Nay, I will not. I do not mean to argue. I mean to tell you of a plan I have, one that will please you, Ranafir added quickly. Gabu grunted skeptically, but waited. You took me when my father went to the gods, began Ranafir carefully. Out of the... He swallowed, but forced it out. Out of the goodness of your heart. I, a gutter waif. If you had not offered me food and lodging, I would be sleeping in the dust of the streets and fighting the dogs for their leavings. Instead, I live comfortably on your bread and you found me work to my liking and did not apprentice me to a fishmonger or or yourself until now. I am a burden to you, a great burden. You have said so many times, have you not, Gebu? Renifir cried, forgetting his speech for a moment in his emotion. Is it not true all I have said? Go on, Gebu said. Again, Renifir swallowed, a great gulp to give him courage, then poured out the rest in a torrent for fear he would not get it out at all. Therefore, I wish to take away the burden of myself. I will leave you and not live on your bread or sleep in your courtyard. Instead, I will build myself a little house in the desert out of bricks that I shall make myself. And I will cut papyrus in the marsh and sell it to the sail makers and buy my own bread and fish and will not need to trouble about me ever again any longer. And I can do this, all this, and never again be a burden to you. If only you will, you would, you will buy me a, a donkey, just one very small donkey to take the to carry the papyrus to the sail makers. It need not be a young donkey, just an old one. I can give you coppers for it when I earn them. And he stopped because Gebu was laughing, at first softly, in little bursts, then louder, then in great gales, first doubling over and then leaning far back with his chin tipped to the sky until the courtyard rang with it and the neighbor across the wall flung back his lattice and began to curse at the noise. Still laughing, even staggering with the force of his laughter, laughter Gebu moved on toward the stairway and up the steps to his room, leaving Ranafir standing silent in the moonlight. When the door of the upstairs room had creaked shut on its leather hinges and the laughter had at last died away, Ranafir turned and walked slowly back to the acacia tree. His plan had not succeeded. He had not really in his heart ever thought it would. Chapter six. There was nothing whatever to do but to go to the stone cutting shop next morning and Ranafir went. Numbly, he walked down familiar streets, past the papyrus march, marsh, past the beginning of the wharves, then with a longing glance ahead at the corner where he had always turned to go to Rex. He turned unwillingly, traitorously, he felt, into a different street, walked past different shops and laboratories and warehouses and stopped at last before the long open shed that was Gebu's stone cutting shop. He had been here only once or twice and each time he had left the place as soon as he could. The whole street rang with the harsh clamor that issued from it. The clatter of chisel on stone, hammer on chisel, granite shrieking against rough granite. It was as different from the music of the little gold hammers as anything could be. Under the low palm thatched roof, he could see stone dusted figures moving about among the great blocks and slabs of stone that stood here and there upon the cluttered dirt floor. One of these figures would be Pai, the foreman, to whom he must present himself. At this season, Gebu was seldom in the shop. He and the greater part of his men were across the river, working on Pharaoh's new addition to the great temple, shaping and fitting stones as they were needed for the walls. Here in the shop, only great sarcophagi were built, and blocks of stone, rough-hewn to size, ready for sculptures. The sculptors themselves worked elsewhere in their own workshops. No carving was done here. No huge image of the gods or pharaoh emerged gradually, majestically from some rough block. No lotus or twining marsh flower traced itself slowly upon an alabaster vase. No little ducks or vultures 
and baskets, all spelling words appeared upon a slab under the skillful chisel of an artist. If Gebu had been a sculptor, Ranafir thought, then at least I could have learned to make something beautiful, if not of gold, then of stone. It would have been something worth learning. There was no use struggling. The gods and Gebu had decreed that he learned this instead, mere cutting and hacking to make the stone ready for others. He sighed and crossed the street to the shop. Hesitating under the straggling fringe of palm fronds, he peered into the shop's interior, which seemed in deep gloom after the blaze of sun in the road. There were a dozen men moving here and there about their tasks, but no one took the slightest notice of him. Near where he stood, an old man squatted on his haunches beside a great slab of alabaster, examining and blowing at a small hollow in one corner of it. As Renifier watched, he rose and hobbled to the next corner of the slab, sprinkled black sand from a box upon a chalk mark on the stone, set the bit of a hand drill on the spot, and began to bore another hollow. His face looked patient, worn, and kindly, and Renifier, hoping the man was Pai, the foreman, approached him. I beg pardon, master, he said hesitantly. The old man went on drilling, slapping the stone weights around and around with one gnarled hand while holding the handle of the spindle with the other. Renifer raised his voice above the sounding noises and touched the old man on the shoulder as he spoke. I beg pardon, master. At his touch, the driller jumped and halted the circling stones, then looked around. He seemed surprised to see Renifer. Eh? I thought you were the foreman. Come to tell me I am doing it all wrong again. What do you want of me, little one? Obviously, this could not be Pi. I am looking for the foreman, Renifer said. Eh? You'll have to shout this noise. I am looking for the foreman, please, Renifer shouted. Ah, the foreman, that would be Pi, young one, the skinny little man yonder. Don't say I called him that. In the far corner, beside the finishers. What do you want of him? I warn you, do not bother him with trifles. His temper is as short as my thumb. The old man held up his right thumb, which Renifer saw, with a shock, was hacked off at the first knuckle. Aye, the wedge slipped when we were splitting a block of granite 20 years ago said the old one with a sidewise grin. And here, he tucked the handle of the drill under his arm and held up the other hand. The chisel went awry one time, and here a hammer crushed my fingertip inside of the sandstone. They are the stonecutter's hands. Not pretty, nay, not pretty at all, but still fairly useful, praise be to the gods. What do you want of pie, young one? I am to report, a, report to him, Renifer answered. He could not take his horrified gaze off the old man's mutilated hands. I am the new apprentice. Aye, well, that's a necessary errand. Go and speak to him, but be sure you shout. He hates nothing so much as people who mumble. I will. Thank you, er, Master Zahotep. That's my name. Only Zahotep. Undercraftsman. Run along with you now. I must drill these sockets or Pi will have my tongue out for wagging so long. Zahotep turned back to his drill and Ranafir stared, started down the length of the shop his bare feet cringing away from the gritty carpet of stone chips that covered the dirt floor. Suppose my hands become like that, he was thinking. Why, I could never work with gold again. I could never handle the little tweezers or solder a delicate joint or shape the little gold leaves. I would be good for nothing but rough work. I could never learn skill in anything. He circled a large block of some green, dark green stone upon which two men knelt facing each other, scrubbing the surface with a block of sandstone. Their bodies worked rhythmically back and forth, and the sandstones produced a series of harsh grating screeches that caused icy trickles to run down Ranafir's spine and set his teeth to aching. He dared not look at their hands. Beyond him, in the farthest corner, three men worked around a great sarcophagus of pink granite, one stretching a red chalk string across its side, the others chipping off the high spots where the string touched and the chalk rubbed off. A man stood surveying these works, his thin arms akimbo, and his fists, one of which grasped an authoritative looking stick, propped on his skinny hips. He was scarcely taller than Ranafir, but he looked as if he were made of twisted wire. Swallowing, Ranafir moved reluctantly to his side and spoke up loudly. I beg pardon, Master Foreman. I? What? Who are you? snapped Pi, 
turning his head and thrusting it toward Ranafir all in one rapid motion. I am Ranafir, the new apprentice. Gebu bade me find you, and Gebu, you will call him master here, if you please. So you are the are the young brother, half brother. Ranafir muttered, muttered rebelliously. Pai either failed to hear or chose to ignore the correction. He was looking with disdain at Ranafir's thin shoulders and arms. He seemed even to be counting his ribs. He sends me these creatures and expects me to make something of them. He remarked to no one in particular. Stonecutter, this one's more fit to become a rat catcher or a twiner of flower wreaths. Well, come along, come along. Burning with resentment and humiliation, Ranafir hurried after him toward the front of the shop. Pai moved with quick, jerky, impatient strides, swinging his stick, thrusting his head this way and that toward the workers he passed like a long-necked bird of prey. He led Ranafir straight back to Zaho Zahotep and the drill and pointed to the box of black sand near the alabaster slab. That is cutting sand, he shouted. Put a little into the hole each time Zahotep raises the drill that the bit may cut deeply. When the sockets are finished, I will set you another task. He spun around and was off down the room with his jerky gait before Ranafir could do more than nod. Glancing at Zahotep inquiringly, Ranafir picked up the box of sand and squatted near the newly begun socket. Instantly, the old man stopped the drill. Young one, stand up or else squat yonder at the other side unless you wish your eyes put out. The sand flies and it will cut flesh as well as stone. Ranafir recoiled so hastily that he stumbled and all but dropped the box. There, now you've spilled some. Don't let Pi see it. Scrape it up with your fingers. Now, put a pinch into, into the hole. This is not ordinary sand, you know. To be spilled and scattered, it is cutting sand, harder than the hardest stone. It is. Aye, that's enough for the moment. Now stand back. Zahotep set the drill twirling again to the gritty, grating rasp of sand against stone while Ranafir stood well aside, his teeth on edge, and looked disconsolate, disconsolate, disconsolately at the great inert slab which could cost a man his thumb. His skill or his eyesight is the price of his labor on it. What was being fashioned of it anyway? The next time the drill stopped, he asked Zahotep, why, this is the lid of the outer coffin of Pharaoh fan, Pharaoh's fan bearer, young one. Do you see yonder where the finishers are working? That is the coffin itself. Aye, a grand one it will be, the finest pink granite with this alabaster lid. I understand his high lordship has ordered two inner coffins also. One of acacia wood, finely joined, all painted and gilded, and the other, the innermost of cedar wood, with his portrait in solid gold set into the lid. Hi, he will go to his tomb in style, that great one. Put it on, in the sand, boy, a pinch only. That's enough. His portrait in solid gold, Ranafir thought as he watched the old man's scarred hand slap the stone weights of the spindle around and around. How wonderful it would be to make such a thing. One would fashion it by raising, like a bull, like a series of little bulls all joined together and of strange shapes, one like the nose, one like the curve of the cheek, one like the chin, the mouth. What stakes would I use to shape a mouth in gold? Just the edge of Rex's smallest one, perhaps, using the smallest of hammers. The noises of the shop faded, and Ranafir stood alone before a line of shaping stakes, moving from one to the other as he tapped out the full curve of a forehead. The clean line of a jaw, the subtle modeling of an upper lip, choosing one and then another little hammer from the rack before him. His mind had paused in puzzled frustration at the golden corner of an eye, when Zahotep's touch on his shoulder brought him with a start out of his daydreaming. The sand, young one, the sand. As Ranafir hastily knelt to the box, the old man darted a glance about the shop. Eh, Pai was not looking that time, but beware the idleness and dreaming, young one. Never think he is not keeping his hawk eye on you. It is everywhere at once, that eye. And if it sees you idling, he'll soon find why he carries that stick. I will not dream any more, Zahotep. Renifer kept to his word, but it was difficult. His task was so small, so monotonous, and so utterly lacking in interest that he found it almost impossible to keep even part of his mind on it. A pinch of sand, a long dull wait, another pinch of sand. He spent that 
he spent what seemed an interminable time watching the hollows slowly form in the four corners of the coffin lid. His eyes gazed from staring at the, at the whirling drill, his ears bombarded with the harsh noises of the shop. What are the hollows for? He asked Sahotep at last. More to fight in attention than because he wanted to know. Why, they are the sockets for the pins to fit into, the old man said. He pointed down the shop to the coffin itself. Do you see those bosses at the top edge of the coffin? One in the corner. When the lid is in, its, in the place, they will fit just so into our sockets, young one, and make the lid fast. It would be too bad to have a lid slipping and, sl and sliding when they carry his high lordship down into his tomb. Privately, Renifer wished lid, coffin, and lordship in the tomb already, but he ref refrained from saying so. Wisely, it turned out, for as he dropped a last pinch of sand into the fourth socket and stood back, he found Pi at his elbow. Finished here, eh? Come along, then. Zahotep has no more need of you. Hurry, hurry, don't lag behind. I'm a busy man, this way. There's a block of granite yonder ready for the smoothing, and I want it out of here by tomorrow. Nebri. The last word was uttered in a roar so thunderous that Ranafir stopped in his tracks, wondering confusedly if it were some order he was supposed to understand and obey. Instantly, Pai's stick was beating a tattoo about his ankles with an irritable, don't lag, don't lag. The foreman strode on again. Ranafir followed hastily. He realized now that the shout had been merely a summons to someone named Nebre, for a gangling figure was hurrying to, toward them from another part of the shop. Pai stopped beside a, bl a block of granite and pointed a bony finger at it just as the newcomer arrived. He was a boy, obviously another apprentice. He was a year or two older than Ranafir and a full head taller with a solid, sullen face. Pai gave them rectangular chunks of sandstone and a few barked out orders. A moment later, Ranafir found himself kneeling on the granite block face to face with Nebri, scrubbing back and forth with his sandstone as he had seen the two men doing earlier and producing the same rasping shrieks from the granite surface. Pai watched them a moment, mouth tight and eyes suspicious, but evidently he found nothing to criticize for he turned suddenly and strode away. As soon as he was gone, Renifer glanced at his companion and ventured a sideways smile. A horrid noise this makes, he says. said. Nebri looked at him blankly and briefly. He said nothing. Renifer's heart sank, but he tried once more. Have you been here long? Again, Nebri raised blank, indifferent eyes. Been here? He repeated. As an apprentice, have you worked long at the shop? Nebri stared a moment, still scrubbing the sandstone back and forth. Aye, he said finally. His eyes went back to his work. Renifer gave up. The longer he knelt there scrubbing away tediously with his glum companion, the more he desired to raise his chunk of sandstone and bring it down with a crack on Nebre's head. When he thought of Heket, he could scarcely keep the tears from his eyes. During the next few days, Renifer learned many things about the stonecutter's trade. He learned that sandstoning was even more monotonous than sanding the drill and far more fatiguing. He learned that rough dressing stone with chisel and hammer to which he was introduced his third day, was the most fatiguing of all. And while it was slightly less boring, it was much more dangerous than either of the other two tasks. He learned that when he grew tired, he made mistakes. And when he made mistakes, Pai pounced like a leopard of Upper Egypt, raining curses and blows indiscriminately upon his already aching back. He learned through fear to keep his mind every instant upon his work, not only because of Pai's wrath, but because of the painful scrapes and gouges inflicted on his hands by the slightest inattention. With the vision of Zahotep's mutilated hands floating always before his eyes, like some evil prophecy, his shoulders and thin arms numb or afire from the unaccustomed labor and his mind in a prison of monotony, he learned above all to hate the stonecutter's trade with a passion which matched in intensity his love for the goldsmiths. Gebu came once each day to the shop, sometimes at mid-morning, usually at the hour of noon, when all work ceased for a time and a blessed silence descended on the shop. During the respite, some of the men ate food they had brought from their homes. Others sprawled on the gritty floor to take a snatch, talk or snatch a few moments sleep. 
One old Zahotep and the two finishers always walked to the wine shop on the corner and drank their refreshment. Ranafir had no food to bring, no coppers to buy wine, no companion to talk to, and during his first few days, he was too tired and sore to sleep or even rest. He merely sat exhausted on a black block of stone and watched dully while Gebu conferred with Pai or strode about examining the progress of the work. Sometimes Gebu went a little went to a little storeroom at the rear of the shop and took out ragged rolls of papyrus or coarse linen, selected one, and growled orders to Pai as he showed it to him. Sometimes he brought a new one to add to the store. Often he took men with him when he left and set sent others back from the temple site to take their places. So there was a continual change of workmen in the shop, and Ranifer gave up trying to remember them all. Occasionally, when a man came with Gebu, and they would pour over some linen scroll together. When this happened, Ranifer turned away and made himself as inconspicuous as possible, feeling the unusual chill run up his spine at the sight of the lank, stoop-shouldered figure, muffled from head to foot in a cloak that made him look like a molting vulture. Wenaman, with his silent cat's feet and queerly bright eyes. However, neither Wenaman nor Gebu ever took the slightest notice of him. Even at home, Gebu seemed to have all but forgotten his young half-brother's existence. He kicked Renafir awake each morning on his way out of the courtyard, tossed him a copper to buy bread, or jerked his thumb toward the storeroom to indicate that there was food laid out. Each evening, he appropriated the boy's scanty wages doled out by Pai. <clears throat> At the close of every long day, the rest of the time, aside from a few furious cuffings to vent an ill humor or mocking taunts to enhance a good one, he ignored Ranafir completely. Ranafir was glad enough to return the favor. At least I'm not stealing for him anymore, he often told himself as he lay on his ragged mat at night, watching the moon float high and tangle itself in the branches of the acacia tree. Someday, please, Amon, I will grow as big as he, and then I will free myself of him somehow, and go back to gold working. And then I will never, never, never look at another block of granite in my life. Meanwhile, he looked at them day after day. His muscles were slow to harden to the rough demands of this sort of labor, and as long as they were taxed beyond their strength each day, their soreness and throbbing disturbed him, disturbed his rest each night, and filled his sleep with fitful dreams. One night, it was not his own aching body, but a certain sound that roused him in the night. Quickly, he raised up on his elbow. Surely he had heard the thin squeak of the leather hinges on Gebu's bedroom door? Commonplace enough by day, in the depths of night, the sound was strange and unnatural. He listened with beating heart, thinking that Gebu was coming to punish him for some error, and expecting every step, second, to hear his step on the stair. He never heard the step. After a long silence, he lay back, puzzled. Had he been mistaken? Or maybe, instead of coming out of his room, Gebu had just gone in? But why? From where? Surely it was later than he usually came home from the Riverside wine shops. Indeed, he had come home from there once already tonight, much earlier in the evening. If the hinges had squeaked just now, it he must have been returning from a second trip. And this time, instead of slamming the gate and stumping noisily across the courtyard as usual, he had slipped as silently as his bulk would allow up the stairs and into his room. There had even been a furtive sound about the way the hinge squeaked, as if he were cautiously easing it shut, as if he did not even want Ranafir to know he had, got, had been gone. Queer, Ranafir thought as he lay down to sleep again, shivering, queer and awful. During these hours, kefts and mysteries possessed the world. Everyone knew that. The baws of the dead fluttered out of their tombs and across the dark faces of face of Egypt, revisiting the places they had known in life. The malevolent spirits of the unburied roamed at will, seeking mischief they could do. The even more fearful beings, like the woman with her head on backward, snatched away any children whose mothers had not bound amulets about their wrists and said the night spell, said the night spell over them before they slept. Surely no errand was urgent enough to draw Gabu out into all that. Then what was the noise? Something in his thoughts had stirred an elusive memory in Ranafir's mind. Finally, he captured it. The night before that day, 
he had brought home the last wineskin from the gold house. He had heard this same tiny sound. Next morning, filled with his plan, he had believed it was the flat, fluttering wings of his father's ba, and that had half waked him. Had the ba come back again tonight? Then he tried to believe it, but it was difficult. Perhaps he had heard only the squeak of hinges that other night too, and the ba had never come at all. Certainly he had not had much help from it. True, he had walked, waked with the plan the next morning, and the plan had worked, but look at the disaster that had followed. Still, he told himself hastily, Father could not have known that would happen. He tried to help me. He did help me. The rest was Gebu's fault, not his. No doubt he has come back to help me again. No doubt I shall wake in the morning with another plan. Next morning, however, all was the same. No marvel had occurred. No plan or even hope had come. A week or so later, he was wakened by the same stealthy squeak. There was no mistaking the sound of the hinges this time. Renifer sat straight up, the goose flesh rising on his arms and little trickles running down his spine. It was the very middle of the night. He could tell from the position of the moon, yet he could hear furtive steps, footsteps creeping down the stairs. He heard them cross the pavement, heard the faint rattle as the gate was opened, a tiny click as it closed. Incredulous. He let out his long-held breath, not once, but twice, three times, really, since he must now give up believing in the helpful Ba. Gebu had gone out into the keft-filled darkness at an hour when all men in their right minds stayed in bed. Where could he be going, and why? Why? Renifer got no answers to his questions, but he did not cease to ask them whenever the nocturnal mystery was repeated, which it was at irregular intervals. He did not, of course, ask any questions of Gebu. He would sooner have thrown himself into a crocodile's jaws. After a time, the hinge squeaked less frequently, then only rarely, or else, as his muscles hardened and his work grew cor correspondingly less exhausting, he slept more deeply and did not hear it. In either case, the matter receded to the back of his mind, still unexplained. It was merely one more thing about Gebu that he could not understand.